So, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the Europractice webinar on microfluidics. Today, we are already at session number five, and we continue with more manufacturing solutions for microfluidic devices. After glass fabrication methods and hybrid solutions, we resume with polymer-based microfluidic consumables for life science applications, and this work will be presented by Dr. Holger Becker of Microfluidic Ship Shop. Before we start, I'd like to repeat again shortly our house rules. You're all muted from the start, and I would like to ask you to remain muted during the whole session. Questions can be posed during the webinar through the chat channel and will be answered to at the end. Let me now introduce you to the speaker of today. Dr. Holger Becker is co-founder and CSO of Microfluidic Ship Shop. He obtained a physics degree from the University of Western Australia and the University of Heidelberg. He started to work on miniaturized systems for chemical analysis during his PhD thesis at Heidelberg University, which he obtained in 95. After two years as research associate at Imperial College with Professor Andreas Mans, he joined Jenoptik Microtechnik in 1998. Since then, he founded and led several companies in the field of microsystem technologies in medicine and life sciences, for which he also received various awards, with most notably a nomination for the Deutsche Gründer Prize in 2004. He is the current chair of the SPIE, Microfluidics, Biomems and Medical Microsystems Conference and serves on the advisory boards of many other health tech conferences. He is also a member of the editorial boards of Microelectronic Engineering and Micro and Nanosystems Journals. In 2014, he was appointed as Fellow of the Royal Society of Chemistry in London, and in 2017, he has been awarded the Ehrennadel, it's a badge of honor, of the German Physical Society. So quite an impressive resume, resume and I believe we all look forward to this talk. So Holger, the floor is yours. <laughs> Thanks, Reed, for the kind introduction. And yeah, good morning, um, good day, good afternoon, or good night, wherever you are uh, listening or dialing into this webinar. What I will be talking about today indeed is polymers as material for microfluidics and especially for micro consumables in life science applications. Um, here is the outline of my talk. Um, it will be first a little bit more coming from the industrial perspective, looking actually into cost structures. So my first two chapters will indeed look a little bit more into the economics of microfluidics. And then of course, into why do we want to use polymers? And of course, then what are the different methods and technologies for polymer microfabrication? And I would like to sum up with some lessons learned in this field. So catching um, in this, uh, series of webinar, we mainly had presentations which were focusing a lot on technical aspects. And we all agreed that the application should actually drive everything. And that could be the materials, the manufacturing, etc. But of course, part of this application is its intended market. And these market properties typically constrain the technical solutions. So you have to take into account things like reimbursement rates, if we talk about diagnostic device, devices, um, acceptable market prices, uh, the distribution channels. I will talk about this food chain later on. So typically, when a, a customer comes to me and says, can you do this and this and that? I always uh, respond with another question, what's the size of your wallet? Because obviously, the technical solutions are constrained by market properties and the budget basically you have for a given part. And this of course becomes even more true when we talk about consumables, so devices which you use once and then have to throw away. Um, this is what I mentioned with the food chain. This is actually a, a slide which I nicked from uh, Jim Clarkson, the, the CEO of uh, AGL uh, in the UK, um, which shows you a little bit the kind of different price levels you see at different states in this food chain. So on the top, you see the official uh, in the US CPT code. So basically that's the value, which in this case, uh, um, a, a body gives to a certain application. So it's listed and the official value, for example, for, for this uh, diagnostic test is $96. 
However, of course, all the research, uh, all the insurance companies negotiate prices with different uh, clinical bodies, with different hospitals. So the average received re uh, reimbursement rate is much less than that. So in this case, um, it would be sixty dollars. The price, however, the companies are selling this diagnostic kit to the hospitals, to the clinicians, is only 35. So there is, first of all, a clinician margin on it. In this case, something like $25, which sounds realistic. Um, then, of course, typically the companies don't really sell directly to the hospitals, but you, you have some kind of a distribution margin. Uh, and again, that's also typically somewhere of the order of 25, let's anywhere between, let's say 20 to 30%. And finally, the, the company who actually makes the cartridges, the actual manufacturing cost is typically some like, in this case, $7. So we're talking about typically in the range of anywhere between 10 to, if you're lucky, 20% of the actual end user price. And this actually is what feeds the microfluidics companies. We're in this case actually at the bottom of this food chain. And even if the selling price looks pretty high, the actual allowable cost for making a device can be pretty low. And as I said, tip, a, a good rule of thumb is typically 10 to 20% of the actual sales price um, is the allowable so-called Cox cost of goods sold. And that leads me to another concept here of the so-called value pyramid. Um, if you look at the relationship between the value of a given application and typically the volume, the number of chips or the number of cartridges sold, you typically see this pyramid. On the top of the pyramid, you have so the high-end applications, the ones which, uh, which have a, a very, very high value and, and, and the Top right image you see, for example, uh, a cartridge from um, the US company NetBio, which basically does uh, the complete genetic analysis from a swap to a genetic profile, which, which identifies certain loci, loci which directly feeds into an FBI database. So that's a, a forensic or a, um, a criminal um, investigation application. And there the value actually is about $1,000 per run. So in this case, uh, if you take this 10 to 20 percent um, rule of thumb, um, if a cartridge costs $100 or even maybe $200, that would still be acceptable. Somewhere uh, below that, you will find the, let's say, more complex consumables like the, the cartridge you see here from um, Biocardis, fully integrated monolithic diagnostic cartridge, all reagents in there, uh, or the other example would be a classical titer plate organ on a chip device. Um, they are fairly complex and they are that for also fairly expensive to make. Um, but you can already, let's say the, the market, the number of cartridges you can expect, the number of parts you can expect is higher than compared to the top end. And then of course, the, the more you go down this pyramid, the, the less cost, the less value, the simpler the chips, but Ideally, of course, the larger number of chips you can produce. And the question I always, or the challenge I always give to, especially startup companies, is try to identify where you are on this value pyramid and try to, especially if you have a new technology, a new product, try to position yourself as high up on this value pyramid as possible. Because if you try with a new technology, which inherently is more expensive than something which has been optimized and in the market for 20 years. If you try to enter a market on the low end of the value pyramid, this is really challenging. And we've seen actually quite a lot of failures of company, companies having not identified a good entry point into this value pyramid. And that leads me to the next uh, point through the, the challenge. The perception is that micro based disposables are always too expensive. People always say, oh, why is it, why does it cost $5? We always thought it would be a dollar a piece or so. There I have to do a bit of academic bashing. If you, if you read a lot of papers, uh, academics always claim, oh, we can make this thing for less than a dollar a piece. And I will show you in some of the next slides why this is a, a really bad misconception. Um, 
I also have included here a table from one of uh, Jens Dufay's papers uh, a couple of years ago, where they compare the cost in this case for uh, cell-based assays, uh, basically a counting of CD4, which is for HIV testing, uh, of conventional clinical um, cell sorters versus uh, chip-based devices. And what you can see immediately that, of course, the cost per test for these large clinical analyzers tend to be less than the cost per test of these cartridge-based solutions. And that's the typical conception in the market that microwave-based solutions or disposables tend to be more expensive if you look at the individual cost per test. If people take not into account, A, of course, the cost of the instrument, and here, of course, you see a big, big difference between these big clinical analyzers and the, the cost of these point of care instruments, but also if you don't take into account all the other so-called costs of ownership, which basically means, of course, if you have these big complex instruments, you need a technician to run it. You typically have a servicing contract. You need a large space for that, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, the big message here is if you talk about cost uh, with regards to microx, always tell people they have to have a more holistic view onto cost and not just look onto the cost of the, of the individual disposable. And this leads me to my next uh, chapter on cost and cost modeling. If we look at a fairly complex molecular diagnostic cartridge, like the one in this picture, you can actually see that it contains a lot of different components, uh, plastic parts, uh, reagents, valves, blisters, et cetera, et cetera. So in this case, actually, uh, we're talking about nine molded parts. It has a couple of valves, for example, at the sample cup. Uh, it, it contains quite a few membranes. Uh, for venting and for bacteria collection. It contains blisters, which are filled with reagents. It contains dry reagents. It contains films to seal channels, et cetera, et cetera. And so you can actually see that if you want to make something for very little money, which already contains, this is, contains 24 individual pieces, obviously it's not going to be a trivial thing. And this leads me to um, cost modeling. The idea is, you know, let's look into which factors are driving the cost of a device. And in this formula, which looks fairly complex in the first place, but if you, if you look at it carefully, it's actually not so complicated. It basically consists out of three main terms. I hope you can see my mouse moving here. The first term, and that actually is what academics typically quote when they say, oh, we can make this device for, for a dollar a piece or 50 cents a piece. This is the material cost. And obviously, even if your manufacturing would be ideal and you have uh, diminishing uh, cost for manufacturing, of course, you can't make a device cheaper than the raw cost of the material. And that, of course, is one of the advantages of polymers, especially if you talk about commodity polymers like polycarbonate, polystyrene, PMMA. There, the cost of the raw material is really low. We're talking about maybe $3, maybe $5 a kilo for these commodity polymers. The second term here are the so-called non-recurrable expenses. So the one-time expenses you need for the development, for tooling, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously that cost per piece scales inverse, inversely proportional to the number of parts. So this one-time cost basically um, is divided or distributed over more parts. Obviously the lower the share of this cost uh, part for the overall cost becomes. And then, and that actually is the interesting term, is the last one here. And that is the so-called economy of scale. C0 is the cost for making the first part and typically the manufacturing cost drops exponentially the more parts you make. And interestingly enough, you have this N here, the large N, that's the cost specific, the process specific cost scaling factor. And the more effective your process is, of course, the quicker this exponential drops. And this is the, the big challenge in optimizing manufacturing, actually to, to optimize, to maximize the, the factor big N here. And I've shown you, we have the, the cartridge before had 24 parts. So the overall cost for the overall car, uh, device is, of course, a sum of this cost curve for all the 24 individual elements, because they typically have different material cost um, and different scaling factors. So it's really important to look a little bit closer into this cost modeling. Uh, 
And obviously, the more complex the device, the more complex this cost modeling becomes. And especially the scaling factors can be extremely different depending on the process, in the sense that some processes like injection molding scale really well, others like assembly, for example, don't scale so well. And of course, it helps to identify which processes have the most cost saving potential and have the best scaling factor and put your effort into what really scales best. And again, something we have learned, people tend to massively underestimate assembly cost. And again, going back to my academic bashing, um, when they say we can make this thing for a dollar a piece, they typically mean the material cost is a dollar. The clean room in the university comes for free and also the time the PhD st student needs to put everything together, and in this case, assembly cost, um, basically is typically not taken in, into account. And that's where they, how they end up with these figures, which typically would not compare to a real full, fast, uh, full cost calculation, which you have to do in industry. Okay, now coming uh, to the core of the talk on, on polymers. Um, why would we need, or why would we want to use polymers? In general, of course, there are requirements for fabrication technologies, um, regardless of the material. First of all, they should be scalable. You want to make a few parts, you want to prototype, and you want to scale up without having uh, a big change in manufacturing technologies. So you would like to have a technology which can make a few parts as well as millions. The second one, and that's a factor which very often is overlooked, is you want to have manufacturing technologies which allow you to make a high dynamic range of structures. You would like to make a 50 micron channel besides a 300 micron reservoir, besides a 30 micron channel, besides a three millimeter high uh, fluidic connector, stuff like that. Um, the heterogeneous integration, hybrid integration of different materials, we have uh, heard already in the previous talks, and I will also elucidate a little bit on that because this really is a pressing, uh, pressing issue. Robustness in manufacturing, you want to have processes which have wide windows of process parameters in order to have a good yield. Because again, that's the th second important factor which um, has an impact on manufacturing cost is yield. How many good parts come out of the end of your production line compared to how many parts you actually make and you have to throw out because certain things don't work. So robustness in the manufacturing process is big and the yeah, cost, in the end, it all boils down to cost. The big advantage of polymers, of course, is the ability to make large numbers of devices by replicating a massa structure, um, which is the geometrical inverse of the final target. And that, of course, is basically how most of your macroscopic parts uh, of plastic are made uh, in, in this world. You know, uh, you take a, a yogurt cup, uh, you take a, a ball pen, you take the casing of your mobile phone, etc. These are all replicated polymer parts. Um, and of course, the idea of using that with microstructures is not something really new, uh, but the adaptation became fairly quickly. And of course, historically, there are a couple of good examples. And for those of you who are old enough to remember the good old vinyl record, that has been uh, available for more than 100 years, and that is a, a replicated microstructure. The typical, um, you can see that on the top right-hand side, um, the grooves on a, on, a, on, a, on a vinyl record have micron structures on them and people have been replicating them for 100 years. This is uh, one of my uh, favorite slides, which I show all the time. This is uh, what I call the technology chain for polymer microfabrication, and especially for microfluidic device manufacturing, uh, starting off with, of course, obviously the design. But again, from a commercial point of view, this is where you make or break the commercial success of your device, because that's where all the different inputs from the different fields come together. Application know-how, the physics of microfix, material science plays a big role, and design to manufacture. Because we talk about polymer replication technologies, at that point, you then have to make master structure, and you can throw the whole range of um, microfabrication technologies at that question, and I have a slide on a little bit more uh, on mastering. Then we talk about replication. So we replicate that master and there are four main technologies to do that. Injection molding, uh, hot embossing, thermoforming and casting. And again, I will go through all these different um, technologies in a second. At that point, you have a microstructured polymer part and to make a functioning microfluidic system out of it or a microfluidic device out of it, you have to go through these backend processing steps, 
which here on the left column are the more physical steps uh, like dicing, drilling, sealing, so make, closing the channels, um, assembly, metallization in case of electrodes. And on the right hand side, you see all the more chemistry or biology, biochemistry related issues, the mobilization of biomolecules, the, the reagent storage, the tuning of surface energies, etc. And then in the end, quality control. What most people don't realize is that if you do prototyping or low volume manufacturing, 80% of the costs are in the front end here, because obviously, you know, making a master structure uh, or setting up the replication process uh, can be fairly expensive. If you, however, scale up your production, you go to volume manufacturing, 80% of the production cost is in the back end. And this is something which you really have to take into account um, if you want to make a design for manufacturing. So let's look at uh, the different steps along this chain. So <clears throat> as I said, the first thing we need if we talk about polymer application is a master structure. Uh, so often you find words like tooling or mold insert, uh, which are used more or less synonymously here. And as I said, almost any microfabrication technology can be used to make that replication master and picking the right one is, can be a, a, a fairly difficult choice because there is no generic recipe. And uh, again, my my general advice is, you know, if you think about structures, try to involve the fabrication people as early as possible in the process. There are a couple of generic requirements for tooling. The first one is with the exception of casting, uh, you typically want to have a tool which has a high mechanical stability also to give you many, many parts. Uh, obviously, it has to have a high accuracy because your part will never be more accurate than your master structure. And you would also like your master to have a suitable surface chemistry so that if you want to separate your replicated part from the master, uh, the forces, the sticking forces between part and tool are minimal because the demolding process is typically the, the, the point in time when the structures are most likely to be damaged. A few examples. On the left hand side, you see a mold insert which comes, uh, which is made out of electroplated nickel. Uh, you make that typically if you have a resist structure, which you electroplate or an etched silicon wafer, which you can electroplate. So you end up with a metal tool. On the right hand side, of course, you can, uh, you see, uh, in this case, a wet etched uh, silicon part. Uh, you can actually use silicon wafers, especially for casting as a replication master. Also for hot embossing, the, the challenge there is silicon is a fairly brittle material. Uh, so these tools, these master structures have the tendency to eventually break. And it's not a classical wear process. So it's statistically, if you have bad luck, it breaks in the second replication cycle. Uh, this is an example of a mechanically machined mold insert. And this is actually the technology we use most often. And the reason for that is the following. First of all, you can see here this dynamic range of feature sizes. You have some small channels. These ones here are, I think, 50 by 50 microns, something like that. And you have large reservoir structures. And of course, the nice thing you can see this here in these ramps, we, you can basically make more or less freeform structures. So if we, and I don't go into detail in this, uh, into this uh, table here because it's a fairly busy one, but it just shows you the different technologies available for making master structures uh, versus the various uh, parameters. We find that mechanical micromachining offers uh, the, let's say, biggest advantage. Limitation is the radius of curvature of intersecting features. And um, if you need that, cu that curvature to be smaller than, say, 20 micron, you have to use any of these uh, lithographical technologies, either in silicon or in a photoresist and do a subsequent electroplating. Let's talk about the actual replication steps. Historically, for microfluids, the first one used for thermoplastic polymers was hot embossing. That was sort of in one of my earlier lives I used to sell these machines you see here in the middle from an optic. Um, the, the big success of this technology basically came from the fact that it has a very, very high replication accuracy. And I'll show you a couple of uh, nanostructures. Nowadays, it's, it's also called nano imprint lithography in the nano world. As a, as a means for an alternative to EUV uh, making nanostructures. The reason for this very high replication accuracy mainly comes from the fact 
that the material does not undergo a phase transition in the process. You start with a polymer wafer and you're always in the solid phase which generates a fairly low internal stress, low, low birefringence, and a very high replication accuracy. A typical example of a hot embossing uh, system a schematic you see on the left-hand side. Um, so what you have is basically a force frame. You have a, an upper and a lower boss, which can be heated and cooled. You have your substrate on one side and your master structure, the mold insert on the other one. And if you look through, that, that's a real process diagram. Uh, what you see here is basically the blue curve is the force and the red and green curve are the temperatures of the top and the bottom uh, where the, the substrate and the, and the mold insert are. So what you basically do is you basically start to heat up your upper and lower plate until you reach the glass transition temperature of the polymer. So the polymer becomes soft and you then apply the embossing force. You more or less immediately start to cool down once the force is implied. So the polymer starts to become rigid again. You hold the force for a certain amount of time and then you basically demold. If you go to really small structures, you have to do everything vacuum. So this happens in a vacuum. Um, what you can see on the one hand side here is the advantage of hot embossing. It's a fairly simple process in the sense that you basically have three or four parameters to play with. Uh, temperatures, the force, the time, um, and that's about it. The drawback you also see here, uh, if you look at the time axis, the cycle time in hot embossing very often or typically is anywhere between five and 10 minutes, which uh, if you use that in an academic setting, you don't care, but for high throughput, that might become a limitation. Um, these are a couple of examples of this very high replication accuracy. These were structures which actually were replicated from a, a dry edge silicon master structure these, these ridges here are 500 nanometers wide. And that's the replicated structure. And you can see how well these structures replicate. You just see a little bit of deformation in the nanometer range here at the top, at the front end of these things. But uh, that's really a, an impressive example of how good the replication accuracy in hot embossing can be. Now there are a few uh, process variants, especially if you look into reel-to-reel -reel continuous processing, where you basically have a polymer film which runs over these reels, and you basically have a master structure on a drum here, like the one shown here. Uh, this technology has the, the, the advantage that potentially it has a really, really high throughput. I mean, it's uh, 3M has been making these reflective uh, films, which you see on, on street signs, for example, which basically have reflective nanostructures on them, uh, basically by square miles. If you've ever been to a, a printing station of a newspaper, yeah, these machines create a huge amount of surface area in a very short amount of time. Um, drawbacks are that there might be a limited choice of materials. So the, the question, you know, what, what polymer film can you get in suitable formats for this material? And of course, the mastering can be a bit of a challenge because it has to be on a, on a drum. People typically use a thin nickel film, which they laser engrave or etch. Um, but there is another fundamental uh, limitation, and that is it allows you only comparatively low height structures because if something sticks out here, then of course the, the trajectory, the top part of the structure would have to travel in one revolution would be larger or longer than the trajectory on the bottom of the structure. So you int introduce quite a lot of differential stress the higher you go. Um, the other challenge, of course, is all the backend processing steps would have to be compatible with this reel-to-reel -reel, um, methodology as well. And as I said, here are just a few examples of nanostructures we made uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, you can see, I mean, these donuts here, for example, they have a width of 60 nanometers uh, and the donut itself is on like 650 nanometers in diameter. And the process development here took some like half an afternoon. So that's a real advantage of hot embossing. If we talk about industrial manufacturing, currently I would say in most of the commercially available disposable devices are made with injection molding because that is the most established technology in the macro world. It is a bit more difficult to adopt in microfabrication because the number of process parameters are higher. And you need high, fairly high requirements with regards to process control and tool stability. The process is you, you feed granular material, polymer material in this feed here. 
drops into the so-called screw area, which is heated and the polymer melts as it travels along the screw. It's then injected with a high pressure, typically some like 1500 bars into this cavity. This cavity is formed by the so-called injection molding tool, which typically consists out of so-called platens. You have a fixed platen, which is this part here, and a moving platen, which opens and closes. And here in the inside, you have your mold insert, and this will form the part. Um, it's important to notice that, of course, you will always have polymer in here. This is the so-called sprue, and this is the gate. That's, these are two important words you, or you have to learn if you talk about injection molding. This is, uh, these are two examples of uh, injection molding tools or machines. Um, and you see, of course, this is a fairly complex piece of precision machine metal. This is a tool for parts the size of a, of a tighter plate, and this weighs about 600 kilos, and you can see lots of different mechanical parts. So this can be fairly expensive. A typical cost for a production tool for a part that size is easily 100,000 euros. So that's where the, the typical prejudice come from that injection molding is only good for high volume production and it's very expensive. The trick, however, is of course standardization. So if you stick to standard formats like a tighter plate or a microscopy slide or a CD here, you can of course reuse this tool as a so-called mold base or family tool and run different designs, different parts on one tool by only replacing this inner mold insert. And that way, injection molding actually becomes price-wise compatible with, with most prototyping technologies, which I will also talk about a little bit later on. Um, we typically say, if you wanna have 100 parts or more, injection molding becomes price-wise compatible. If you stick to standard formats, that's the limitation. Many people like to compare injection molding versus hot embossing. Um, there is indeed a certain overlap, but they all have their specific advantages and disadvantages. With hot embossing, as I mentioned, you can make very, very small features and especially they are good for planar structures. Drawback is typically in hot embossing, you need a mechanical post-processing. So you typically work on a wafer, so you have to dice, or if you have holes, uh, you, most, you typically embossing through holes can be difficult. Advantage is few parameters in the process development, so that ha happens quickly. And because you only need the mold insert, the initial tooling cost is pretty low. As at cycle time, three to seven, five to 10, somewhere in the sort of, let's say five to 10 minutes would be typical. With injection molding, it's an established technology. The process development typically takes longer because you have many parameters to optimize, but you get finished 3D parts, so which do not need mechanical post-processing. Holes are not a problem and the part come out in its final shape. So no mechanical post-processing. Can be fully automated, uh, but it can have, if you don't use a family tool, high initial tooling cost. Cycle time typically can be anywhere from say 10 seconds to maybe two minutes. In most cases, let's say no more than a minute piece. The next one, uh, which I only want to go on shortly, is elastomer casting, which of course is a huge success in the academic world, uh, thanks to George Whitesides, who proposed that sometime in the, in the mid-1990s. Um, the reason why it's such a huge success in the academic world, it's, it's a very simple process. I mean, you actually don't even would need a, a clean room for that. Um, what you typically have is a two component system where you have a base elastomer and a curing agent, you mix them, you pour them on top of the master structure, you cure it uh, overnight or in an oven for a couple of hours, you peel it off and off you go. And of course, PDMS is the most widely used material uh, which comes under the trade, trade name of Silgard. Um, because of its elastic behavior, you can actually incorporate active fluidic elements like you know valves or pumps or these, let's see if the movie works. Uh, you know, stretchable membranes for organ on a chip uh, applications. However, unfortunately, I have not, for example, found any source of uh, membranes, for example, in PDMS or any other uh, silicone elastomer, which would be thinner than say 100 micron. And very often you would like to have something thinner. So people always do the membranes themselves by spin coating, for example. But, and there are two big buts 
And that's why I always urge people if they think about commercializing their devices not to use PDMS. The first one you can see here in these fluorescent images is PDMS absorbs small molecules. PDMS basically is a sponge. And what you can see here, this is a, basically a channel filled with rhodamine. And over the course of a few hours, you can see how much of that dye is diffusing into the surrounding polymer material. The second one is, and that's something I would really like to counter the common perception that PDMS is cheap. It's not. PDMS is really expensive. PDMS is about $100 a kilo versus, you know, $5 to $10 for most of the thermoplastic polymers and not even talking about glass or so. So PDMS is an expensive material and the processing is, is expensive. So if you think about using or commercializing your device, please don't use PDMS and don't use PDMS's prototypes. Final replication method is uh, microthermal forming. You all know that basically uh, from yogurt cups, for example, that's, these are typically made with that. So they are used in macro world for thin walled packages or a Coke bottle, for example. It's a fairly low cost method, uh, but also a comparatively low precision one, which creates a lot of internal stress because what you do is you have a, a thin film and you can see a SEM picture here from these uh, cell containers. You start with a thin film and then you push either <clears throat> with overpressure on that side or vacuum on the other side. You basically push that, that film into its desired shape. And what you can see is here, you pull out the material. So out of these 50 micron in on the top of these uh, cell cages, you have some like seven micron left. A few more examples here. That's uh, from, the, from Imtech uh, in Freiburg. Uh, they thermoform these uh, uh, disks for uh, molecular di uh, diagnostics. The reason here is, of course, you, you can do that with a comparatively thin film. So you have a good heat um, transport through the material in case of uh, PCR. But their molding time, at least with their existing setup, was comparatively long. What we are using thermoforming for actually is to make blisters. Reason is, this is a, a process which does not really need micron precision because blisters are macroscopic parts. Uh, and in this case, actually, you can make blisters in a few seconds. So the thermoforming process is really fast. So we've talked about now the replication processes. The question is, you know, what about prototyping? The ideal prototyping technology, of course, uh, does not have any initial fixed cost for masks and tools. It would use the, uh, the same material as later on for high volume production. It allows you to make geometries which are compatible with, with replication technology. So you don't really get, uh, let's say the, the results you obtain from a proto prototype can be used directly for volume production. And of course it's fast and it, it gives you high resolution parts. Uh, when people talk about uh, prototyping, everybody now of course talks about 3D printing. There are basically two ways of uh, 3D printing the one which uh, most likely or most widely used in, in microfluidics is stereolithography, where you have a light source and you focus your light beam into um, a tank or a bath of a photoresin, so a photocurable polymer, which cross-links under the exposure to photons. And this way you basically build up a device by writing one layer, you push up that state, you write the next layer and etc. So you build up the device layer by layer. Um, that's an example of a high-end solution from, from the company Nanoscribe in, in Karlsruhe. Really great machines, enormous resolution. It can really make sub-micron features. Maybe you can just see the scale bar here. So these towers are less than 20 micron across. So which these little walls here are probably two micron wide or so. So very, very high resolution, very nice. Um, so it fulfills certainly this uh, no or low fixed cost criterion. The biggest challenge for stereolithography is the materials, because obviously it's not a material which you would use for volume production technologies. Very often um, it's getting better, but most of the materials you use in stereolithography are still fairly cytotoxic, not biocompatible, and they fluoresce like hell. Because I mean, you need photoactive centers and you typically don't polymerize every single monomer in the solution. So you typically have a fairly high fluorescent background. 
uh, the geometries tend to be compatible with, with replication technologies if you keep that in mind, if you design the part. Um, the fast and high resolution here, I put both uh, a cross and a, a checkbox here because typically it goes against each other. The higher the resolution, the longer it takes to make the parts. And if we look at a little bit more uh, low end versions versus you know the 100,000 uh, euro plus machines from NanoScribe, these are the ones you would find in quite a lot of the Microfix lab, the Micraft or the Formlabs devices. They typically have printing times of a few hours per, let's say, yeah, centimeter size device. The alternative 3D printing method is fused deposition modeling, where you have a thread, uh, basically, or a filament in a material, which you push through a heated nozzle, so you extrude the filament onto a stage. Um, this has the advantage that you actually use a classical thermoplastic polymer. You can actually nowadays even get COC um, for uh, these uh, thread materials. Um, drawback in this case mainly is the geometrical resolution. Um, nominally, these uh, 3D printers, at least the ones who are a little bit more expensive than the $300 dollar DIY devices. Um, they have a nominal resolution of about 100 micron, but if you tell them to print a, a 100 micron channel, it's typically 100 micron plus minus 20 or so. You, you typically see the layering and, and the, it's not very, very um, well defined. Um, the next uh, prototyping method, and that's actually the one which we use most or which is our preferred method, is direct mechanical machining. Uh, using um, yeah, mechanical milling. And you see here an example of a 30 micron end mill. So this thing really has a, a diameter of 30 micron. Um, the big advantage here is actually its precision. You can see here an example. This is a passive butterfly valve, a capillary stop valve. This is here is a 50 micron channel. This is a 100 micron channel. And you can see, I mean, this really does 50 micron plus minus one or so with, with regard to precision. So it fulfills most of these criteria. The drawback is if you have a fairly complex device, it can actually take a day or two on, on these milling machines to really process it. So it's not just you know, a few minutes or an hour or something like that. That's the limitation. But in other than that, it fulfills all the other criteria. And especially it fulfills the material criteria. You can basically machine in the same materials as you would do later on in the molded parts. And it, typically creates uh, geometries which are really directly compatible with replication technologies. Finally, a laser cut laminate stack is one of the prototyping technologies. Uh, that works best the, the simpler the structures are, so you have less layers. So what you basically have is you have a sheet out of, say, PMMA coated with a with a with a polymer uh, with a, with an adhesive on one side, you laser cut it and then you add one stack on top of each other until you get the final structure. Uh, the biggest advantage here is that that tends to be a very fast method because the laser cutting takes a very, very short time. It has some limitations with regard to resolution. So making channels which are smaller than say 100 micron or maybe 150 micron becomes a little bit of a challenge. And of course, you have to, you, you typically then in the end have this stack of polymer, adhesive, polymer, adhesive, polymer, adhesive. So the post-processing and the material are a bit of a challenge here. Okay. Um, once we have structured the parts, we of course have to go through these backend processing steps. And one of them, of course, is how to seal these polymer channels. And unfortunately, there is not the method for sealing channels, but there are dozens of methods. Gluing, you know, with adhesives, of course, is one thing, but uh, what can go wrong shows, uh, is shown in this picture, which I like a lot because I'd rather like to show things which can go wrong. In this case, there's just too much glue here. So the glue runs into the channel, deforms the, the uh, channel cross section here a little bit. You have some runoff down here, so you get uneven surface chemistry along these ones. So if you want to glue, make sure that you only need a little or if you can dispense very little and you can do that with transfer methods, for example. Lamination is another technology where you basically have uh, a tape which is already pre-coated with, uh, with glue and that typically tends to be a little bit less 
So the danger of glue running into the channel is less, but you then have one channel wall, which is glue and the other ones is not. So for optical methods, for example, that might have limitations. Ultrasonic welding is possible, laser welding, thermal bonding, uh, plus, as I said, at least another dozen more technologies to do that. And it's important, again, the application should dictate which technology you're using. The other one I would briefly like to mention is the integration of liquid reagents, especially using blisters, because the big challenge in blisters is you have to get the reagent out of it. So you have to burst the blister. And the way how it's, it's typically done is that you have some piercing structures, some needles, so you lower the blister onto these piercing structures, the, the needle pierces the bottom film, and then the liquid can run, run out in a very controlled manner. And the nice thing about uh, replication technologies, especially of course injection molding is, that these needles come for free. They are part of the molded cartridge body, there is no assembly, they, yeah, as I said, they just come for free. Um, we heard already in the previous presentations a lot about heterogeneous integration or hybrid integration. And indeed, that's something we, we see in a lot of projects popping up, that the more complex the cartridges become, there is increased material heterogeneity. Just a few examples on the right-hand side. So you might want to integrate sensors like this one. That's a GMR sensor for cytometry or this one here, an electro, um, a nano electrode sensor. You want to include the blisters, which obviously are different materials. Filters or membranes, like uh, the one you see here. Magnetic elements, you can just barely make it out here. Uh, this is something to steer magnetic particles. Uh, you might have waveguides, you might have electrodes, you might have these printed circuit boards. And um, the challenge here is that different manufacturing volumes and designs require different manufacturing solutions, but all these methods face the challenge of scalability. So again, <clears throat> try to select materials which allow you to make prototypes as well as high volume things. And I will quickly talk about a few of these uh, hybrid integration methods. The first method, which is basically what everybody is using for prototyping, is the use of a solid adhesive. That can be a double-sided adhesive tape, can be pressure sensitive adhesive, can be a dry resist. So you have the part with your micro with your microfluidic structure. You have your sensor, for example, which you would like to uh, use. And then you have, as I said, either a PSA, an adhesive tape, double-sided adhesive tape, can be uh, dry resist on the sensor, um, and you basically glue them together. The big advantage, and that's of course why everybody is using that, or most people using that for prototyping, it, it basically always works. You find a good material combination and, and adhesive for almost anything. It also has low initial cost because you don't need special tools for that. But there are a couple of resolutions. One thing is, of course, the geometrical resolution. You know, if you, let's say, laser cut an adhesive tape, making channels which are smaller than 100 micron is a challenge and having very sharp edges is a challenge. Assembly of this fairly feeble thing can be a challenge. Um, it comes only in fixed thicknesses, unless you use a, a dry resist, which has other uh, challenges. And of course, again, the scalability can be a challenge because the automation uh, of handling these very feeble tapes can be a challenge. Second method is liquid adhesive. In this case, you basically create a second channel around your initial channel, which you then fill with your liquid adhesive. Um, again, the nice thing is this has fewer parts because it's only the top part and the bottom part and the sensor in between. Um, this can be automated by you know, dispensing the, the, the liquid adhesive into this channel with an automated pipetting robot or so. But it also has the drawback that it has limited resolution and design restraints. And you need very high precise parts and high precise dispensers because of course there's always the risk of you dispense too much, it spills, it clogs the initial structure. Um, you have to cure your um, adhesive, your liquid adhesive, either with UV light or with temperature, which in both cases might be a challenge if you have biomolecules here on the sensor which don't like UV light or high temperature. The third one, and again, a lot of people are using that, is just uh, an elastomeric gasket. So you have your fluidic channels here, your sensor, and you basically just put a, a gasket out of PDMS or another rubber in between. 
which is fairly robust and it actually works. It helps, you know, if these parts are a little bit warped, it helps to um, <clears throat> alleviate some of these uh, uh, imprecision problems and it can compensate for temperature. But again, re uh, geometrical resolution limits and, you know, to actually manufacture this thin gasket can be a challenge in itself. Plus, you also have to somehow put these parts together uh, and very often that needs an external mechanical fixture. The coolest one, which if it would work all the time, would be direct bonding. So you basically surface activate your sensor and your molded part and just stick them together. Very simple process, very few parts, which would be the preferred method, but it has a lot of buts. It typically only works with surfaces which you can actually activate. So in case of silicon, you need a silicon oxide surface and a matching chemistry on the molded part. And unfortunately, the activation would destroy any of the biofunctionality on the surface. So it doesn't work if you have biomolecules on the surface or you have to mask them, which again is driving the cost. And the biggest limitation, it does not work for applications with temperature ramps because of the difference in thermal expansion coefficients. Final method, and that of course is the gold standard for high volume production is two component molding. So in this case, you basically mold whatever kind of gasketing structure you have with a second component directly into the molded part. Ideal because it's the lowest number of parts, it's optimized for manufacturing, it has comparatively little design, design constraints so you can make these structures pretty small. Big drawback is very expensive tools and there is no good prototyping equivalent for that. We're working on that, but yeah, it's you have to jump into shelling out a lot of money for the tool. But it's clearly the preferred method for high volume pr production because also the, man, the the assembly is simple. You just you can see that here in this hook structure, you just basically clip in whatever sensor you have. That's it. No adhesive, no chemistry, just mechanical clamping. Okay, lessons learned. Uh, the first thing is there's no one size fits all solution. It's really uh, the application should drive your technical solution also in this field and what works in academia might clearly not be a commercially viable solution. Um, you've seen that there is little standardization. So this is my 30 second pitch for the micro association, which is organizing this uh, standardization process and have a look at the website here. Try to look around what's uh, out there in the labs with regards to existing standards like size, you know, a microscopy slide or a tighter plate or interfaces. Expect still several design iterations to be necessary. Uh, especially if you have a complex device, expect that it will the first design will not work perfectly. It will work, but not perfectly. Always keep scalability in mind when you select your manufacturing technology. It's really important to be able to scale up ideally seamlessly from prototyping to high volume. And for this, as I said, we use injection molding with standardized form factors, with standardized outer dimensions as a way to really make parts from 100 pieces upward. Try to talk to manufacturing people as early as possible in your product development process to actually get a design to manufacture because that design makes or breaks your commercial success. If you don't do a design to manufacture, you get a device which works, but it will be a factor of three too expensive. And try to avoid what is shown on the right hand side, try to avoid over engineering. This is something we see lots and lots and lots of time. People come up with, uh, yeah, over specified de um, devices. Um, on the other hand, you know, a clever design can really uh, save a long, uh, a lot of money in the long run. And I'm a firm believer of the KISS principle. And if you don't know what that means, just Google it. So uh, we had that uh, question coming up in the previous talks all the time. When do you use polymers or not? When would I use polymers? Clearly, if I have disposables which are under any kind of cost consideration because it's more or less the only way to really make low, low cost devices. The second one is if your device has a high dynamic range of feature sizes because there is basically no other way how to make uh, 50 micron structures besides hundreds of micron structures besides millimeter structures. And of course, if you really go to high volume production and then the replication methods really have a very good economy of scale. When would I not use polymers? First of all, if I have harsh conditions like temperatures, for example, if I want to build an analytical device which goes down into a borehole for the oil industry, polymers might not be the best solution. 
or if you talk about um, chemical synthesis uh, in with high organic uh, um, solvent concentrations. Um, also, if you have a device which is not uh, disposable, so which can be used often, like a microreactor, which then also has less cost, falls under less cost constraints, uh, you might look into alternative materials. And finally, if you have a technology which requires nanopores, um, we have been, I mean, there are technologies to make micro holes in, in polymers, but I have not found a way to make nano, nano pores, nano holes in, in polymer materials. In this case, you're still limited to silicon or silicon nitride. Okay, with this, I'm basically at the end of my presentation. Um, I think, or I hope I have given you a, a feeling of which parameters should drive or which considerations should drive the selection of materials and manufacturing methods. And unfortunately, in this world, it really basically is cost and money which drives this decision coming from being a, an, intricate, an intimate part of the application. The application drives everything, but the application often is just uh, is constrained by cost. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Kerr, uh, for this interesting presentation and enthusiastic talk. And as an engineer, indeed, we sometimes wrongly think that the world needs mainly technical solutions, but obviously there's more to it and uh, reminding us of the business aspects of, of product development was quite uh, refreshing, that it's not only about uh, technology. So now we are ready for uh, the question uh, session. Um, thank you for already answering answering to one of uh, them, so I can already skip one. Uh, but nevertheless, there is one other uh, general question I always ask, and that's about, um, could you share your vision on what are the main bottlenecks to be solved for further growth of microfluidic devices and, and more market introductions? Um, I think, and that's actually an indication of how much this field has matured, is that I don't think that there are big uh, hurdles or big bottlenecks or big stumbling blocks. Nowadays, it's typically bits and pieces. For example, how to make cheap electrodes is something, you know, high resolution electrodes which would not need lithography or not need a vacuum process. Um, so I think there, there are lots of smaller technological constraints which might have to be solved to, to grow, uh, drive the growth, but Overall, I think, I mean, we are in an exponential growth factor, uh, growth mm -hmm. um, period. I mean, wherever we look, I mean, um, the number of parts we produce goes up really exponentially in all our applications. Uh, the acceptance in the public, and I mean, of course, COVID-19 testing is uh, one of the uh, examples which suddenly brings this uh, into the public eye. Um, yeah, as I said, I think, uh, we are we are past the fundamental stumbling blocks. Okay, so actually what I hear is that also here it's mainly about further cost reductions and maybe process simplifications. Is that yeah, I mean that's why summary? I showed this this yeah. pyramid, this um, this value pyramid. Of course, in in the beginning, a lot of the applications were in this top of the pyramid where it really makes sense. And if you want to really make, uh, let's say, expand the market, you have to trickle down this pyramid. You have to go to these lower value applications. And for this, yes, cost considerations and cost optimization, cost optimized processes will be the key. Okay, clear. Uh, then if I may refer to the ASICs uh, industry, eh, where there are actually only a limited amount of limited amount of fabs, but many application companies. Do you also see same trends in the microfluidic uh, business? So will we go to more OEM uh, companies having in-house production or will we have um, yeah, consolidation of, of manufacturing partners? That's a good question because, uh, I mean, obviously we're some like 50 years behind the microelectronics mm -hmm. industry. Um, and what we see in a difference, I mean, a lot of people try to compare microelectronics to microfluidics. Um, I think we see a, a much more differentiated application case. And in this case, that would, in my opinion, also lead to, let's say, a more, uh, uh, let's say, an ecosystem with a higher biodiversity in the sense that we will see many more business models. Uh, we see, for example, in the large diagnostic industry, 
both cases where companies produce in-house as well as outsourcing of production. Uh, we see that a lot of the application companies indeed don't want to be bothered with manufacturing or actually don't really have the engineering skill. So they, they basically outsource the manufacturing and want to receive a fully packaged device, which they just have to distribute or where they might have to add a little bit more of their biochemistry know-how. But at least I would say for the next five to 10 years, we will see a very diverse ecosystem here. Yeah, okay, thanks for uh, your view on this. And indeed, it's probably not so um, straightforward to have a one-to-one -one copy as with uh, the ASICS industry. So now there are also a few more uh, pure technical questions. Um, one is uh, how is the nickel insert, the nickel insert mold, I think, attached to the mounting plates? Yeah, for this, um, we typically make comparatively thick nickel typically say two millimeters, three millimeters, and then it's mechan with, with mechanical screws yeah. uh, mounted okay. onto a tool. Yeah, clear. Um, then um, could you also comment a little on blister filling? Um, blister filling is basically done with any of these commercially available pipetting robots. The, the challenge is that a blister, let's say you thermoform this, this blister dome, which has a nominal value of a nominal volume of 100 microliters. You dispense 100 microliters in it, and then it forms because of the surface tension and the hydrophobic nature of the, the blister material, it forms a meniscus. So either uh, if you then seal the blister, you, you push out the liquid and you run into the danger of uh, incomplete blister sealing because uh, the surface is suddenly wetted mm -hmm. with, with your reagent, or you underfill and then you have a little bit of, of air in the blister. So um, yeah, it's, it can be a, a tricky process. And again, it's, you know, the, beside the wallet, say, you know, can you live with, you know, one or 2% air in the blister? Or do you have a reagent which would react with oxygen? So you have to do everything under a nitrogen atmosphere. Or you say we can't have any kind of gas in there. Um, so we, we have to actually do a compression step after the filling. So uh, again, it's, there are different technical solutions depending on how much money you would like to invest. Yeah, so also here, not one single uh, exactly. solution, no, no. but the blister itself, could you consider that as a component of the I, microfluidic device or, or yeah, there I, I, I always tell people don't look at a blister as an isolated component, but it's always a part of okay. the overall design because the force, for example, you need to operate a blister depends on the blister dimensions on the piercing mechanism. Do I have one needle? Do I have three needles? How sharp are these needles? But also on the microwave system. What's the hydrodynamic resistance of the microtennel structure? So you can't really look at the blister as an isolated component. It's always yeah. part of a system. Yeah, okay, indeed. Uh, clear answer. Uh, and then maybe one last question. It was question, yeah, sorry. Is uh, what is the usual surface roughness of the different technologies uh, and what is preferred or what is needed? Um, if we do injection molding and we polish the mold insert, we have RMS roughnesses easily of lambda 10, so say 40 nanometers. Mm -hmm. And if we push it, it can go down to lambda 20th, so I'm like 20 nanometers. In direct machining, uh, depending on the machine quality, the surface roughness is typically of the order of, say, 200 nanometers RMS to maybe 800 nanometers. So a machined plastic part would have this slightly frosted appearance. So if you look through it, it's not perfectly clear. However, if you fill, the channel, you typically get an index matching and you get a good optic, or you get a, re let's say, reasonable optical clearance. Um, the surface roughness of obviously is can be a challenge in rapid prototyping if you talk about um, 3D printing, both in mm -hmm. stereolithography as well as in, in, in fused deposition models, unless you have these high-end machines from Nanoscribe or so. Uh, they, of course, make, again, optical surfaces, but then they can only make small parts. Yeah, okay, thanks. Maybe uh, if you don't mind, one last question then, if that's possible. Um, 
to answer at least which polymers are preferred and why. Um, okay. If it um, would take there, you too far. Yeah. Uh, no, no. I mean, there's there's actually a, a fairly clear cut to that. There are typically, I, I, I would say, out what what is out in the market and what we're we're using are basically five polymers. Uh, I would say fifty percent would be the olefinic polymer COC COP. Reason why people like to use them is very good optical properties, very low autofluorescence. Um, initially um, high contact angle, so high, high, uh, high, highly hydrophobic, which basically means low intrinsic protein adsorption, so low unspecific binding, and they are good to mold. So uh, these are compelling arguments. Drawback is they are a little bit more expensive than the classical commodity plastics. So as at 50%, I would say COC, COP. Uh, the next uh, group would be polycarbonate and polystyrene as the more conventional polymers. Um, polycarbonate, clearly nice optical properties, high, um, high temperature of use. So for example, if you have a device in which you would like to do PCR, polycarbonate would be a good material to use. A uh, drawback is higher, higher autofluorescence compared to COC, COP. Um, yeah, and it's uh, polycarbonate is not so easy to machine if you do prototyping. That would be the two limitations, but it's as a cheaper than COC, COP. Polystyrene is a material which a lot of the, the, let's say, biologists are using simply because they are used to that material. You know, all the Petri dishes were for decades made in polystyrene, so they are well known with the surface chemistry low cost polymer, uh, but not so good optical properties compared to the olefinic polymers. And the first one would be PMMA acrylic. Um, that has been the material which has was the first one to be used in, um, let's say, thermoplastic polymer microfabrication. Um, good to machine, low cost, Drawback is it's very, very sensitive towards organic uh, reagents, organic uh, solvents. So even a low concentration organic solvent will immediately lead to stress cracking. So for this reason, it's nowadays actually very little used in, in microfluidics. But if you only have a, um, um, an aqueous solution, then that's also a, an acceptable material. Okay, thanks again, uh, Holger, for sharing all your insights in this matter. Uh, thank you all for participating to these webinars again. And uh, we are having a short break now. The next and last presentation in this series is planned for July the 8th. It will be given by Oliver Fulmer from XFAP and presenting uh, Making Silicon-Based Microfluidics Work, Solutions for Cost-Effective Integrated Microfluidic Systems. So hope to see you then and have a great day. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.